right, hey everybody, welcome to another wonderful webinar um, here from the UE Systems and our friends at Iridicio. Uh, my name is Maureen, and today we've got Sean Eisenhower talking lemons to lemonade, uh, a look at change management through the COVID-19 experience, and boy, are we all experiencing it. So um, looking forward to what he's got to say today. Um, are you all hearing me? It sounds like maybe my audio is a little off. You sound hey, Sean, good on my can end. you hear me okay? Okay, all right, good, good, good. I had a couple people chiming in. So if, if you're not hearing me well, um, turn your speakers up. Maybe that'll help. Um, okay, so before we dive in, um, again, just welcome. I'm sure we've got some new faces with us today, and I'm sure we've also got some folks who've been kind of tuning in with us each week. Um, so we're, we're happy to have you back um, and welcome to the new folks. Um, but I will reiterate again uh, that, you know, definitely here at UE Systems, we, we're, we're here to be a support for you guys during this time, whether you're, you know, working from home or if your plant um, is, is even crazier than usual, whatever the case may be, um, you know, lean on us. We're, we're happy to hop on webinars with you guys, do one-on-one -on -one software trainings, equipment trainings. Um, work with you on different applications if you're, you know, wondering what more you could be doing with, with your instrument if, if you have um, an ultra ultra sound instrument. Um, so just kind of think of us as your personal trainer during this time. Um, and please don't hesitate to to reach out to us. We're happy to do it. We're we're looking for we're looking for things to do um, and and ways to connect with our customers and and you know keep us busy during this time as well. And to that end, um, our friends at Iridicio are also here to, to be a support. Um, so through their efforts at Iridicio and Friends Support, um, they've got some no-cost short-term project-based learning opportunities, videos, e-learning. They have their coaches available um, for, for no-cost coaching hours, which is a huge benefit, a huge um, opportunity for folks. I really hope people are taking advantage of that. Um, you can check all that out, including the, the webinars that we've been doing um, kind of on steroids here for the last five weeks or so. Um, all those that we've been recording, they're all archived on, on this website, help.iridicio.com. So check that out as well. Um, in addition to, you know, we're, we're putting all of these on our website and YouTube and all that good stuff. So that's there. Um, just a little housekeeping before I before I turn it over to Sean. So like I just said, we are recording this. So we'll put it up on YouTube, um, hopefully before the end of the day, we'll have it on our website. They'll have it on the, that website I just told you about. So if you have to hop off, um, you certainly can, can check out the rest later or share it with, with friends, colleagues that, that might have missed it. Um, we definitely welcome questions. So you can type those into the questions box. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, any questions we don't get to, we will be sure we, we get all the questions over to Sean and his team, and they'll be sure to follow up and, and get all those questions answered. We are going to be doing some polls during today's webinar, so um, kind of be on the lookout for those. Um, it should be pretty obvious how to respond to those um, as, we, as we toss them over to you guys. Um, but just trying to make this a little more interactive. Um, if you guys know Sean sitting behind a computer screen presenting is not his favorite way to present. Um, he'd much prefer to be out and about in front of you all. But um, since we can't do that right now, we'll, we'll make the most of our situ current situation. And um, just my last little disclaimer um, to just ignore any crazy sounds you might hear. Um, I worry that I've been too lucky on all of these webinars for the last five weeks that a dog hasn't randomly started barking or a child hasn't come asking for a snack. Um, so who knows? Hopefully today's not that day, but we'll just power through if it is. So with all that said, Sean, I am going to turn the screen over to you and we'll talk change. All right, I'm going to go ahead and launch the presentation here. We should be good. Welcome, everybody. I'm Sean Eisenhower, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about lemons to lemonade. And really and truly, where I want to focus today is in the change management world, the soft side of uh, what a lot of us do. 
Um, we are going to look at it though from the perspective of what at least some of us have gone through and I'm calling the COVID change. This, this period of either working from home or working from the office but not attending any meetings using Zoom and Skype and all these other technologies. So I, uh, I'm going to approach it from that that perspective and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about it as we go forward. For those of you that I haven't met on the call, uh, this is a little bit about me. Uh, I am located here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we uh, currently office on board the USS Yorktown in Charleston Harbor, um, but this also kind of covers more of uh, things outside of work uh, as well. So you can see my daughter over in the corner of the picture there. Uh, she's actually sitting about 15, not even 15 feet, about five feet away from me, uh, watching today and and seeing what happens. And uh, so she's a big part of uh, everything that I do. And of course, now that she never goes to school, ever, ever, ever goes to school, um, she's with me quite a bit. So, uh, um, so with that said, you can see some other things on this page. We do produce a lot of videos. So over in the corner, you can see me. Uh, diffusing uh, what's supposed to be a bomb, but you might recognize as two Pringles cans and an iPhone, uh, as well as some parts left over from my air conditioning unit. But we get to produce a lot of videos. Uh, we also produce a lot of blogs. Uh, the reliabilitynow.com blog is one that I put some content on. We also have the hpreliability.com blog. Uh, so there's, there's content out there from that direction. Uh, and then we also have the podcast available, and if you're not familiar with our podcast, I think that's uh, one of the things that uh, can be a really nice benefit, a really nice add moving forward, especially if you've got a, a traditional commute of, of 30 minutes or so, you can, you can jump in and enjoy those podcasts. And those are available over, uh, over on all the platforms, really, and all you have to do is search for Rooted in Reliability. So that's a little bit about me, a uh, little bit about the current situation. Let's dive right into the presentation. So what I'm talking about today is, is something that I am super passionate about. And I know not everybody's really passionate about change management and leadership and the soft side. A lot of people want to talk about the technical stuff. But what I will tell you is having now been in this industry and, and helping people implement reliability for probably 15 or 20 years, um, this makes all the difference. It, it really makes all the difference because a lot of the stuff that we do at the end of the day is really not that hard from a technical standpoint. It's only hard because we got to change culture. We got to change people. We got to get folks to do things differently. So that is uh, definitely something that uh, I, I want to kind of stress as we go into this. I know, especially for you hardcore engineers on the call, the people side is not that interesting. But at the end of the day, if we do this right, you will stand out. And that's, that's why I put this graphic up here. All right, so we're going to head in and I'm going to take you through a few more lemony examples here uh, before we get into the COVID stuff. So the second thing, it takes a lot of lemons to make lemonade. And that really is, is twofold for me. I, I don't know how many of you are, are currently doing reliability implementations. Uh, in fact, it may not be a bad time, uh, Maureen, if you don't mind, to go ahead and launch that poll just to see if anybody's doing uh, currently or is ready to do one when they get back or was mid into one uh, earlier. Let's launch that poll and see if they're involved with a reliability implementation. Now, while she launches okay. that poll, I'll continue okay. on. All right, the poll's open, so you guys should be able to see it now and give us a little feedback. Um, but from our perspective, what we know is reliability is a big deal change. It changes job descriptions, it changes operations, it changes maintenance, it changes engineering. So it affects a lot of the organization. So it really does affect a lot of different lemons, if you will. Now, what I will tell you is at the end of the day too, I believe you've got to use a lot of different tools. Now they all come together under some broad umbrellas, but you've got to use a lot of different tools. So for me, it takes a lot of lemons to make a lot of lemonade. Talks about the number of people that I've got to get engaged, but it also talks about uh, the tools that I want to bring to the table. And I'm going to try to give you an introduction to some of those tools today. So Maureen, you mind sharing with us what you found on that poll? 
Yeah, so it looks like about 50% of the folks have um, responded, and of those, 73% um, are currently involved in the reliability implementation. So um, I can't do that math, but there you go. 75% of 40, wow. 50%. Okay, that's, even, <laughs> that's, that's even higher than I thought it was going to be. So, all right, very good. So we're going to We'll use some very specific examples to reliability as we move forward uh, through the rest of the presentation. Thank you for that, Maureen. So it takes a lot of lemons to make lemonade, first point or second point. Third point, mold grows on lemonades that lie. And what I mean here is you really have to drive the change. You can't just meander toward reliability. You can have a good vision, you can have a good direction, but if you're meandering there, um, I just, I, I don't see the, the same level of um, results, but I also don't see uh, the sustaining power either because, you know, so many of the pieces that we talk about have um, interconnections. And if I don't have one thing working, then it kind of gets moldy waiting on the other thing that's needed for it to work. So my point here is mold grows on lemons that lie around. Now my next big lemon point is that some lemons have to be crushed to make lemonade. And you can see them down there. And at the end of the day, I, I, I do believe that as we go forward, there are going to be some sacred cows, some things that we've always done that way, some things that, you know, why should I change? It's been that way for 20 years. It's worked just fine. So we're going to have to crush those lemons uh, in order to really move forward. And so just be prepared for that. I mean, make sure it's part of your communication. It's part of your risk management plan. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. All right. So with that said, at the end of the day, I just want to make sure that as we go through these examples, it's that transition from lemon to lemonade, uh, and I'm going to transition into the COVID situation now. We're going to talk about that because that's definitely delivered uh, a pretty big basket of lemons to a lot of folks. And I think as you go through, I think you'll be able to relate to some of this. So Maureen, as I get ready, if you could go ahead and launch the poll on how many of them are working from home currently. Okay, here we go. All right, while you guys are participating in that poll, we're gonna leave that open through my next slide. Uh, and this is a slide that if you've seen me present lately, it's something that I really like to talk about. But by the same token, um, I, I, uh, I, I just I think it's so poignant for a lot of a lot of facilities. Uh, and what this is talking about is that there are three distinct zones as you go through a change or as you learn new things. And many of you had hey, to Sean. learn. Zoom. Yes. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but. I don't think, as the, according to my screen, I think it's showing that um, ah, you can't if see a poll my is open, they can't see your slide. So, so I'll just let you know that we got about 63% of the folks have voted, and 75% of them are again, they are, they are yes, they are working from home. So, um, okay, right. there you go. So I think I'll close that out so they can see the slide because it's important. Thank you, I appreciate it. Very good, very good. So just like you guys, we're learning new things here as well. Uh, and uh, so there's a, a good example of exactly what I'm going to be talking about on this slide that you can now see on your screen. So many of you are working from home. My guess is most of you haven't worked from home in the past, uh, probably haven't used Zoom very much and some of the tools that have now become somewhat commonplace over the last four, five, six weeks. Um, so these phases that you see along the bottom that I mentioned earlier before you guys could see it, the first one you see is this beginner zone, the second one you see is this danger zone, and the third one you see is this expert zone. And um, these were huge for me, and I'll tell you what the, where these came from. They came from aviation. Uh, some of you know I'm a pilot, uh, and so I enjoy uh, following that and figuring out what's going on and what's new there. And I was doing a little bit of reading and I stumbled across this. And and what it basically says that that people that are in the beginner zone or their first learning to fly an airplane, 
they're very interested in learning. They'll listen to really boring webinars. They will spend time reading really long articles. They'll do anything it takes to grasp the concepts that they need. But then at some point, uh, and we know where that point is for aviation, it's about 200 hours. At about 200 hours of flight time, they suddenly become experts. They suddenly experience this, oh, I, I got it now, I got this, no problem. I know how Zoom works, I, I got this all figured out, let's just jump on that webinar, Maureen will launch that poll and I'll keep talking right through it and they won't be able to see a thing. So you get in that situation where you're in the danger zone with the technology. And that also happens in the aviation world. In that aviation world danger zone, what we see there is individuals uh, making very poor choices uh, that typically don't work out that well. Uh, in fact, most of the aviation accidents that occur that are, that are um, pointed to pilot error fall in this category. Uh, it's pilots that are between 200 hours and 800 hours. And then the last zone you see there is this expert zone. And this is that old, bold pilot or that old pilot that has been flying for many years and, and can share what they do and, and teach other people, but they also are continuously learning. They learn that there's so much more to flying an airplane than just pulling back on the stick. There's the mechanics, there's the, there's the, um, reading a chart, there is uh, communication via the radio and using the right words and, and understanding what airports are in what classifications. There's just so much more to it. And so they become kind of gurus that are continuing to seek knowledge. So the reason I put this slide up though is a lot of us have probably gone through some of the, the, the curves that are on here. Uh, the first one you see there in pink is how much I realize there is to know. The second one you see kind of in a tan color is how much I actually know. And the third one that's in a yellow color or a mustard color is how much I think I know. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about you moving into the COVID world that you're living in now, or whether we're talking about reliability implementation, or even just a facet of reliability like RCM or RCA. What you will see is people go through the beginner zone where they're super interested and they want to learn more. And then sometimes only after a few days, they're like, oh, I got this. I know how to do RCA. See, what you do is you use five wise and fish bones. And if you use that, everything will be fine. And they couldn't be any more wrong. But their curve, their yellow curve of how much they think they know is very high at that point. So that danger zone is definitely something to watch out for as you're moving forward, whether it's, you know, in this new environment you're working in or whether it's it's later on as you start implementing things back in the facility. I think another real good example of this that I've seen on a couple of uh, conference calls so far or a couple of webinars or web calls uh, is is where we get real comfortable with using Zoom or using WebEx or whatever you're doing. And then all of a sudden you see someone get up and, and go to the bathroom and you can see them walk right into the bathroom and you're like, you know, I'm pretty sure they didn't want us to see that. Or you see them grab a, a, a frosty adult beverage and pull it around in front of the screen, forgetting that they're, they're living in an environment where everyone can see them. So that's another example of where we get into that danger zone. We get comfortable and we kind of forget what's going on and what's happening. Hey, Sean, are you speaking from personal experience there? No, no, there's no personal experience here on this webinar. I'm oh, using okay. from other people. I see. Okay. Just, just All right. So let's, travel, let's travel a little further into this and, and talk a little bit about something that's been a big lemon for a lot of folks, the whole COVID situation. And as I go through this presentation, please understand I am not making light of COVID in the situation. Obviously, it's a very serious thing that has caused a, a, a lot of uh, uh, just really unfortunate things to happen, whether that be sickness or even worse. But by the same token, as we look at what's happened and how it's forced us to change, it really does fit the change curve. And so I've put some examples here uh, of the change curve, and we'll dive deeper into it here in a few minutes. But as you look, um, you see a couple phases, and I'll describe these and, uh, and, and give you a little bit of a picture of each as we go forward. So here in this first phase, you see what we call 
the Hawthorne effect. And what that is, it's based on a study that was done in England. It's actually something you can find out a lot about by uh, Googling. It's uh, got its own wiki page. Um, but the Hawthorne effect basically states that as we pay attention to a scenario, performance will get better. So as we look at the people that work for us or the people we're working with and we pay attention to a certain detail, their performance of that detail will increase. And that's what the curve represents. That first bump is the fact that we start talking about it and we talk about it, people do a better job of it and we see that improvement. Now, if you've ever been involved in a CMMS or an EAM implementation, a computerized maintenance management system or an enterprise asset management system, this is what we see when we start talking about the fact that we're going to implement SAP. We actually see an increase in performance or the increase of use for the old CMMS system that sits there. And you can see that data. You can see people start using the CMMS or EAM more, even though we haven't switched over to the new system yet. Now for the COVID curve, some of the things that I heard during this period of time is, oh, this is awesome. It's like a snow day. I get to work from home. I'll get to see my kids more often. And you know what? I'm going to clean up that garage. I've been meaning to clean up that garage. I'll do it while I'm on a conference call. Nobody will know. So those are the kind of words that I heard in, in week one of a lot of people staying home. Uh, talking to my friends and participating in some happy hours, uh, virtually of course, uh, those were the kind of things that, uh, that, that came up in week one. And I imagine some of you guys can think about those as well. So as we move down into the red area or what I call the valley of despair here, this is really, for some people, this was week two, some it was week three, week four. Um, maybe some of you are still in this valley of despair. Um, and it can depend, depending on how big the change was for you. But the valley of despair is where I heard comments on calls like, Zoom is the devil. And for God's sake, can Bill not mute his dogs? And then the discovery that maybe the teachers aren't the problem with my kids. It's my kids that are the problem. All right, those are the kind of things that I heard people saying in that week two, week three, week four range. And that really is this valley of despair. You know, it was exciting in week one, but now this new environment is not that much fun in week two, three, and four. Things don't work the way they used to. I can't do things efficient like I used to could. It's just a lot of issues from that perspective. So then as we move up that curve and we move out of that valley of despair and the yellow line crosses back over the neutral level of performance, we start to transition into an area where we're starting to get good at it. We're starting to find out what the, and I hate this phrase because I've heard it so much, but what the new normal is. You know, how I'm going to work in this environment, how I'm going to interact with my peers, what that's going to look like. And, and some of the things that I, uh, I've i heard people talk about that are in this phase of the change is, I like working from my porch swing. My coffee tastes better than that awful nonsense they serve at work. Zoom breakouts are a good way to have a conversation. Zero traffic. I haven't had to sit in traffic in four or five weeks. How amazing is that? And for some of the students that I've been working with, my plan is working. I'm starting to see progress. I'm starting to see me move further into this implementation, even though I'm doing it remotely. So that's that next phase. And we're going to call that the third phase. And you'll see that come back up a little later. And then the fourth phase you see here is maybe not a lot of you, but there's probably a few of you that have hit stage four. I have a couple text messages and a couple emails on my phone. I actually saved them for this call because it was folks really starting to move from this stage three into that stage four. I'm going to read just one of those to you that I got the other day. And this one, I would say, fits in that stage three area. Um, he, he responded to me and said, hey, I, I, I think we're starting to settle in, which is good. We were acting like this was a short-term event, 
and kept looking for the end versus living in it. So that's that stage three. Oh, okay. This isn't a short-term blip on the radar. This isn't just going to be a flash in the pan. This isn't going to be a flavor of the month. We're really going to have to do this. And, you know, those same kind of things pop up in a, in a, a reliability implementation or a change initiative. So as we move up to four up there at the very top, some of the words that I've heard the folks say that I feel like are really excelling uh, at this phase, they're saying stuff like, I'm getting so much more done or the days fly by. And then I jokingly put in there, Zoom happy hours are amazing. All right. Now, there are a few folks that I have talked to that did move through this curve pretty quickly. And it may have been because they already wanted to work from home. They were interested in working from home. They just had to figure out how to do it. So they were highly motivated to get out of the valley of despair and to get into that new level of performance. Um, and, you know, so they're saying things like, oh, this is so much better. I don't have to have all that small talk. All right, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened that have made them successful, but they had a desire to move. They had a desire to work in that new environment and there was something driving them forward. So some lemons aren't so good. They don't taste right, they don't look right. And I wanna show you what that would look like if we overlaid it on that same graphic. And so what we're looking at here now is another curve and it's a curve for those folks that maybe have no desire to work at home they're not interested in working at home they're easily distracted at home all right so we're going to walk through this one and you're going to notice that these folks they they went in the valley of despair and quite frankly they didn't come out uh, and if you call these folks you'll recognize them because they may be getting a lot of stuff done at home, but it's not for work. They've cleaned their garage. They've cleaned their attic. They've worked in the yard. They've done a lot of things, but they aren't staying engaged in their job. And the unfortunate part of this at the end of the day, unfortunately, is I believe they'll come out the other side. They'll have very little to show for it, and the unemployment line will be calling. Um, now, it doesn't always have to be at work. Uh, I mean, I, I would say this same kind of thing holds true even with some of your waistlines. I know this definitely holds true for mine. I went into week one of this thing really excited because I had just started really working out well. I'd been working out about two or three months, so I was into it and things were going really good. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. I don't have that commute time. I can go and start working out upstairs. And, and then go right into my morning and get things done. And that's all fine and dandy. That's the Hawthorne effect. But then exactly what I'm showing here is exactly what happened. In fact, I got distracted. I got distracted by other things and workload picked up and I, I had excuses. And the next thing I know, I've been bouncing along the Valley of Despair and I picked up 10 or 12 pounds while doing it because it's real easy. In fact, it was my birthday uh, last week. So it was real easy or is real easy to go downstairs and get some birthday cake. And that takes a lot less time, feels just as good, but takes a lot less time than doing a workout. So, you know, if, even if you've been pretty diligent and you've stuck with it from a work standpoint and you've really been able to get things done, you may be able to think about things other than work that you thought were gonna go really well that unfortunately uh, have fallen down into that valley and haven't quite recovered. Now, this same thing will happen with reliability implementations, especially if they're not managed very well. So some of the things I'm gonna share with you as we move a little further into this are specifically to help you prevent this valley of despair, this elongated valley of despair moving forward. Now, the first thing, and I'm going to kind of step you through my way of thinking on this. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is having a vision and having a charter. But before I do that, uh, Maureen, if you would launch the poll on maturity, I'd like to see kind of how mature a lot of the folks are on the call. And what we're looking for as Maureen launches this poll is, would you consider yourself highly mature and being a 10, which would mean that you've got 
uh, planning in place and scheduling in place and problem solving in place and you've got a lot of the right tools and processes and you deliver on time and you deliver with a low cost of maintenance uh, that that's a 10 that's the cupcake okay, side so, or a five because we did a scale oh, of one to five, five but scales. people that's get five, it sorry. you get we it we did a five scale for you guys <laughs> and then at the one scale side that is going to be a very reactive organization that is one that is firefighting on the daily um, one where the planner really doesn't plan that much uh, one where uh, reliability engineers look more like advanced technicians and they're 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 not really focused on using reliability tools so that's a one and then a five is cupcakes and rainbows five is beautiful i've got all the right things in place if you can take just a minute or so and and give us some feedback and then maureen if you'll give me the percentages i'll jot them down yep i will Let's, they're still coming in and i know some of you are having a hard time responding it, i'm guessing that there's some browsers that this program is, is not great with so i apologize for that but um thanks for trying <laughs> So we're kind of at that 50%, which seems to be about what we're getting as far as participation. And we've got about 8% are showing poor, 35% are at a two, 44%, so right there in the middle, and 12% at a four, and we've only got 1% at a five. Very cool. Well, congratulations to that 1%. <laughs> All right. Well, so that's yeah. that's very interesting and, and, and probably not that far from what we would see if we looked out across industry. So for those of you that are in that three, four, five, well, really three, four, if you're five, you've arrived. But if you're in that three, four range, what I'm going to tell you is a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about next is even more important because it becomes incrementally more difficult to implement in that higher level if you're in the ones and twos bless your heart because you've got low-hanging fruit everywhere you've got ways that you can show success you're gonna have an easier time getting the ball rolling so that's certainly not a bad place to be um, these tools that I'm going to talk about over the next few slides are critical to both groups the ones and twos and the threes and fours but what I will tell you is it's, I, I believe it's absolutely critical for the threes and fours because you just have to dot every I and cross every T. So the first thing that I've put up here is just a simple A3 charter. Um, this one happens to be one that, that includes an RCA, but in a traditional A3 charter, you've got your business opportunity up there at the top. What is this worth? What's the value? Uh, you've got your current condition down at the bottom. Uh, in the first box on the bottom there and that's going to tell me about what I'm experiencing today uh, Some people will actually put a SWOT analysis in that current condition and I'll show you one of those in a second um, The target condition that's where I want to be in 12 months 18 months six months Whatever you decide for your implementation uh, Is is going to be that's you're painting that picture of what the future looks like and then in that last box underneath target condition is going to be your action plan. How are you going to get there? Now, I'm going to show you some more in-depth plans because I do believe that that planning is critical. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a few minutes. But this, this one document, this one document on a three size sheet of paper really conveys to the organization what it is you're trying to do, how you're going to get there, what it's worth to the organization. It's all right there in one page. Um, so it can really help with your communication efforts. So the second thing I want you to think about is that when you look at reliability or when you think about reliability and you're, you're beginning your implementation, as we talked about earlier, you have to remember everyone is going to see it differently. And so if you look at my screen right now, a lot of you will see six different animals, but some of you will only see three. So I'll give you just a second to take a look there. So some of you see uh, a deer, an elephant, and a giraffe, and then you see a mirror that reflects them or the water reflecting them down below. The rest of you see another set of animals there at the bottom. 
So at the bottom, we've got a seal, we've got a swan, and we've got a penguin. Now, they are the exact same, but we all see them differently. And so my point for putting this up here in the beginning is communication early on is really about setting common definitions and common understandings. Everyone really needs to begin to see things the same way. They need to see all six of the animals that are on this page. The next piece is we need to be able to understand that there is an order to implementation. And I feel like a lot of sites, unfortunately, miss this step. They don't think about the fact that there are certain things that are kind of foundational that have to be done before you can do others. And the simple example that I always use is, it's really cool to go out and buy a bunch of predictive maintenance tools, but if you don't have work control and planning and scheduling, all you're gonna do is identify a bunch of defects that are gonna end up running to failure anyway. So the only value you get out of it is the fact that you can stand in that operations meeting and look at them and say, see, I told you it was gonna happen. So at the end of the day, there is an order for how these things need to happen. And I will tell you, this order is not perfectly the same for every site. You know, if you've got a history or there are some things that have been done in the past, sometimes the order changes. But there are things that have to happen first, and those are the near things shown on the road. And then there are things that happen further down the way uh, as we move further out. And a good example, and you'll notice it's way out there about that blue sign that says optimize and sustain, you see TPM, uh, or as some people think of it, more autonomous maintenance or operator care. Um, there's more to it than just operator care, but a lot of folks will try to implement that without having all the stuff down below. And it really becomes a uh, unfortunately a distraction and it's just not very effective what i say is we have to get our house in order first before we start inviting the operators in to participate so my point here again for this slide is just to point out the fact that it has to be there has to be an order and this has to be reflected in the plan that you're using moving going forward now, another piece that I like to talk about is this light bulb model, and this is an implementation strategy for reliability that we use internal to Iridicio. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but I do want to pull out a few points here. First of all, and this is a core belief for me, I think you have to have a pilot area. Unless your facility is just so small that you know your whole facility is the pilot area, then I feel like you want to break out a machine, an equipment line, an area, and make that the place where you're going to start really improving reliability. Now, the reason I say that is because I see a lot of folks kind of use the shotgun approach to reliability. They'll do a little bit of criticality in one area. They'll do a little bit of root calls in another area because the supervisor in that area likes to do root calls. And we'll do some reliability-centered maintenance or RCM in one area because there's an engineer over there that really likes to do FMEAs and he's really good at it. But what we end up with is this disjointed reliability. It's, it's not cohesive, it doesn't connect, and it's not together in one area. And that's one of the things that I am a huge proponent of is that there are connections between all those elements we saw on the road and they really need to be in one area so that you can see those results. The other thing is if I create one area that's really successful and, and do the right things, then that area right there can be a model. It can prove to the rest of the organization that this can be done within our facility. So the model that you see here, I've got focus teams that are focusing in specific areas. I've got a leadership team that is removing barriers and setting direction. I've got a pilot area that they're all starting in. And then once that pilot area is locked in, we are rolling out those changes in that second area, that third area, that fourth area, and so forth and so on. Now, the one other point that I will bring to the table is you will notice that in those little circles that are the focus teams, that work control, planning, and scheduling, there are different colored dots. Those represent individuals, and they represent the colors of the areas below. So if you're going to implement reliability in a pilot area, don't just use the people from that pilot area. 
use people from the rest of the facility so that they're bought into the solution, they understand the solution, and they can become champions for you as you carry it out to those other areas long term. Hope that makes sense, but if you have questions, feel free to and or reach out to me later and we can talk more about it. So the second thing that I, or one of the big things that I said earlier, but the second thing I want to focus on here is you've got to have a good plan. And uh, good plans are tough. They're not fun. Uh, most people don't find them super exciting. But what I will tell you is that the initiatives that I see that have a good project plan that is broken down into small pieces and they keep it up to date and move it forward, they tend to move on average about twice as fast as those who meander their way through. Uh, that kind of just, you know, do what they want to do in the areas they want to do it. So um, I think it's absolutely critical to have these plans. And those of you that know me know that, you know, this feels constraining to me because it tells me what I got to do and it doesn't allow for creativity and a lot of the other things. But if you don't have this, it will take you longer. You will meander to a path and it will, I mean, it's it's kind of like, you know, if I were going to leave from here in Charleston and and drive up to Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, and I didn't have a map and I just kind of meandered my way, I might eventually get there, but it's going to take a lot longer than taking that that direct path that's, that's shown in my GPS. So absolutely critical to have a really solid project plan. Now, I want to ask a question about this one. So I'm going to have Maureen, uh, if you'll launch the poll, the poll for Cotter. Uh, are you familiar with John Cotter and his work on change management? And I learned we got we got some good uh, troubleshooters on this webinar because a bunch of you all figured out that if you go out of full screen mode, you will be able to answer the question. So if you're having a hard time answering the poll question before, apparently you can't be in full screen. So it seems silly to me, but that's, I guess, how the GoTo webinar is set up. So. Oh, anyway, the joy. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're getting more participation now, so that, that was good. That makes some folks. Awesome, um, awesome. Hey, we're, we're learning yeah. as we go. We're moving through the curve. Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. So we're getting close to about 70% of folks participating, and right now I'm seeing 22% yes, 78% no. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. I can't go too deep on the call just because we're, we'll run out of time, but with 78% not having been introduced to John Cotter, John Cotter is one of those guys that if you're doing a big deal change in your organization like reliability, you really want to take the time to understand some of his material. It just makes things a lot easier. Um, so the, the one I'm going to share with you today is called the Eight Stages of Effective Change. Uh, it, is, it is from John Cotter. If you've seen a version that I created a few weeks ago or months ago, uh, you'll notice I've added some boxes to it, but I've, I've gone back to the original model here. Uh, you can find this in John Cotter's book called Leading Change, and I highly, highly recommend that book. Um, it's just a really good way to understand more about what the organization is going to need as they go forward. So with that said, um, what these boxes that are here represent is what you need to do to help your organization move. And I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. So if you want to spend more time with them, all you got to do is join me for coaching hours and we can talk about these a ton because I think they're really critical. The first thing you see is you got to establish a sense of urgency. You got to show folks what's in it for them, why we're doing it, why now, why now, not yesterday or last week or last year, why what I've been doing in the past won't work anymore in the future. You really have to create that urgency or as some people call it, that burning platform. I always think about the old Mario game where you run across the bridge and the bridge is burning behind you. You can't turn back because you've got that sense of urgency. And that's what we want to create in box one here. So as you start your reliability initiative, if you can't clearly articulate why you're doing it, then I would suggest you're going to struggle. And I have seen more than a few organizations over the years that couldn't clearly articulate this sense of urgency and they did struggle. They really did. Um, pharmaceuticals was one that this happens a lot because 
you know, it's just, it's not as critical for them. So uh, having a sense of urgency, absolutely critical. Second box, form a powerful guiding coalition. You've got to get operations involved, engineering involved, maintenance involved. You want to get all of that organization engaged in your change. Third box, create a vision and strategy. Now, I shared with you a few minutes ago the A3. The A3 is a good way to start creating that vision and the strategy moving forward. And then the master plan is the rest of that strategy. So if you've got those two steps in your initiative, you've checked this box off. You can feel pretty comfortable, at least that you've started that process. Now, the next piece is communicating that vision. And you'll remember with that A3 I talked about, it's a great tool to begin to communicate to the rest of the organization. The next one is empowering others to act upon the vision. So you can't own it forever. You need to get others involved. You need to get people in your focus teams that are going to focus on those areas and own those tools moving forward. Then you want to plan and create short-term wins. Now, for me, I talked earlier about the pilot area, and I think the pilot area is critical. And because that, that pilot area is my area to create short-term wins and check this box. Now, as I implement that pilot area and then I start rolling it out to other areas within the facility, I am checking the box for this next category, which is consolidating improvements and produce more change. And then last but not least in the Cotter model is institution institutionalize and anchor the new approach. And this is the things we do with metrics and processes and, and other elements to really hold and support the change until it becomes part of the way we do business and the new norm. So I love this. I could spend a ton of time with it. I can't today, but if you want to talk more about it, feel free to reach out. Now, um, the other model that I want to show you, there's really two uh, that I want to talk about uh, here, and I'm going to do these. Um, I'm going to jump down to the bottom of the page first, and then I'm going to go to the top. So what you see down at the bottom are five letters, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. So A-D-K-A-R. It's the ADCAR model, and it comes from an organization called ProSci. And so, Maureen, if you don't mind launching that poll for ProSci, I'd love to know how many folks have been engaged or involved or have used the ADCAR model in the past. Now, we're going to keep this one pretty quick, so uh, jump to it if you want to participate, uh, and then we're going to bounce right into situational leadership. Yeah, kind of seeing the same as the last kind of the 80-20 split um, with 80 being no, 20 being yes. Okay, very good, very so, good. All right, go. so the 80-20 the rule holds for us once more. So this ADCAR model uh, is, is a great model. Um, Jeffrey Hyatt would tell you it's a great model for organizational change. I would suggest that I use it very much for individual change. So if you look at the Cotter model, it says form a powerful guiding coalition up there in the second black box. I believe that the ADCAR model helps me to form a powerful guiding coalition. I also believe that the ADCAR model works in the box where it says empower others to act upon the vision. So ADCAR is a simple step-by-step -step process for getting folks engaged and getting them involved. Awareness is first, then desire. You can't, uh, you know, you can't get desire until you tell them what it is and how it affects them. Knowledge can only be delivered once they have a desire for knowledge. If not, it's like pouring water on a duck's back. It just runs right off. And then once you have a knowledge, knowledge is really not that valuable until you show that you can do something with it. And that's the ability to do something. And then just like we saw with Cotter, the last box is reinforcement. So we want to reinforce that change moving forward. So with that said, that's the ADCAR model. Again, you want to talk more about it or how it connects with the other two, reach out to me. The last one you see here is the situational leadership model. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this today, but what I will tell you is this is exactly what I was showing you earlier with the, the curves looking at the COVID situation. You see in that first area, that, that Hawthorne effect peak, you see that valley of despair, you see them moving up to the new level of performance, and then you see them getting to that new level of performance. Those match directly with the boxes down below. Um, directing or S1 style goes with the Hawthorne effect box. S2 or coaching goes with the valley of despair. 
S3 is the other valley of despair as we start to climb up and, and to that new level of performance. We refer to that in the Situational Leadership 2 style called supporting. And then S4 is that fourth level. It's up there at the very top where you're performing in your new environment very effectively. Um, and the, as a leader, there are things that you can do for folks as they move through each of those phases. In fact, what I'll tell you is if you don't do them, uh, you can run into some pretty pretty nasty situations. And I've got examples of screwing that up many times over the years. So, uh, you know, it's, it's something where I'm not asking you to change your leadership style wholesale, but I'm asking you to really look at the needs of the people that are going through the change and make sure you're matching the needs for the time that they're in the situation. So here's another example of a charter. Again, as we talked about, it's got to be clear to the organization what we're doing and where we're going and why we're doing that. Once we do that, I mentioned earlier that you can use a SWOT analysis. And if you've used a SWOT before, it's simply, again, another four quadrant box. It seems like there's a hundred of them, uh, but one is for strengths. Two is for weaknesses, three is opportunities, and four is threats. The things at the top are within your environment, the things at the bottom are outside of your environment. Uh, so that gives you an idea for, for kind of what this is, but it also allows you to paint a really good picture of the current state. So if you're trying to fill that current state box, that can be very helpful moving forward. Now, don't forget the money, and I put this slide up there just to say that, because sometimes we get real wrapped around reliability, and we want to talk about betas and etas and mean time between failure and, and uh, all these other facets of it, which are great, and they're very important, but at the end of the day, operations doesn't care about what the beta and the eta is. What they care about is how much money can we save if we implement reliability or asset management or maintenance improvement or whatever the case may be. So always remember to talk in those dollars at the end of the day. We got to speak the language of operations in order to get their buy-in. The business FMEA that I've included here is just a way of thinking about the risk to this implementation. So if you're in a reliability implementation now, have you gone through and thought about all the things that could go wrong? And have you listed them out? And have you looked at how likely they are to happen and how bad they would hurt if they did? And, and, and whether you can detect them before they arrive? And have you put something in place to mitigate that, either through a communication plan or any of the uh, number of other tools that are available? But have you done something that will model proactive behavior instead of just reacting to the issues that arise as you go through the implementation? Um, I love this tool. It's, it's, it's a great time to be negative and be grumpy and complain about all the things that could go wrong. But at the end of the day, we'll sort them using risk priority number and we'll go after the high risk items to our implementation. Once you finish your risk management plan, you can see your communication plan here. Many of the things that you will identify in the risk management plan can actually be addressed with a communication plan. So this communication plan has the, the timing, the audience, what I want to send, who needs to be delivering it or whether it's going to be delivered via email or it's going to be delivered face to face or it's going to be delivered in a video or or whatever the case may be, but this allows you to build a good communication plan that addresses those risks that we saw, but it addresses them at the times that we've identified. So we're not just talking about them when they don't mean anything. So first step, create that A3. Understand where you're going, get that vision, that mission, all of those things solid. Second step, start to look at the risk that could cause this thing to fail. And then third step, build yourself a communication plan to make sure that you're talking to the organization about the problems that are gonna come up before they actually arrive. In fact, what you want to do or what you want to hear is the organization say to you, it's like you had a crystal ball. If they say to you, Anything like that, you know you have fought through a lot of the risk in advance and you've put together a really good communication plan moving forward. So at the end of the day, if you use the tools that we've talked about today, you can be a crushing success with change management. 
Uh, but if you look back to what you've done over this COVID term, you can also, I think, draw some definite parallels to how you went through each of those phases over the last four, five, six, seven weeks. So I hope and I wish that all of you will be able to use these tools as you go back into your facilities and you start to, to really try to make the changes that you've been working on. I know I've talked to a lot of our students about things like they're doing PM optimization or they're redoing criticality or they've been working on work control processes. So when you get back, if you will think about these tools and those things like ADCAR and, and situational leadership, I think that'll really help you make a change in your organization. And if you can do that, then at the end of the day, I hope your lemons actually become a martini. I've enjoyed spending a little time with you guys today. I hope if you uh, if you have questions or you want to talk about this more, you'll reach out to me. Um, I would love to uh, to kind of chat more about your specific situation and things that you're facing. So feel free to do that. That's uh, something that we've enjoyed a lot of here over the last few weeks, and it's been it's, honestly it's been kind of a highlight talking to a lot of folks as they move through some of these changes. So I'll put my information up here. Uh, that is my cell phone number there. That'll ring directly to the phone that is below me. If you call it right now, you will hear it ring. So I don't recommend that. Um, but with that said, I would love to talk with you and learn a little bit more about what you're doing in your facility. With that, I'll turn it back awesome. over to Marie. Yep. No, that was great. Thank you. And um, I know a few slides back you mentioned that folks shouldn't just run out and buy a bunch of technology and, and predictive tools and things like that. Of course, being a company that sells those, I, I might disagree, but uh, no, I, I, we get to your point. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but if you but want to run out and buy a bunch of ultrasound equipment, come on, we're ready. We're, we're here for you. Um, and we will support you along the way. But anyway, I'm um, just poking a little fun. Um, so awesome presentation. If you've got some questions, um, get those in real quick. Um, I do have one here, Sean. Um, someone was just looking if you could restate the name of the, the Cotter book. Um, so oh, yes. That down. The, the Cotter book is, uh, it is by John Cotter, and it's called Leading Change. He has about, I don't know, 10, 12, maybe 18 other books, but the one that I specifically pulled that graphic from is called Leading Change. Okay, awesome. And then, um, so I've had several people um, asking about the presentation being available. I, I was recording this, so if you missed that at the beginning, um, we did record it. I will get it up on YouTube. We'll have it on our website. Um, they'll have it up on the help.iridicio.com site. Um, so you can definitely check that out again, as well as all of our other presentations. So just keep that in mind. And I'm going to um, just take the screen back here from you, Sean, because I got a couple closing slides. Um, so, and I just realized that forgot to put tomorrow's webinar, but we do have, you know, some more webinars coming up tomorrow. We're going to be talking ultrasound um, and uh, online condition monitoring um, and remote monitoring. So if that's of interest to you and you didn't see the invite, just reach out to me uh, and I'll get you the, the link to register. But we're, we're looking forward to talking about that tomorrow. We've actually got some new products um, that we're going to be kind of launching tomorrow as well that, that I think people will be pretty excited about. So check that out. Then next week, um, our friends at Eurydicio are going to be back talking the black hole of maintenance um, and your maintenance backlog. Um, probably a pretty relevant topic, again, with, with some folks not obviously being at their plant and things like that. So um, check that out. And then on Friday next week, we're going to be doing uh, ultrasound assisted lubrication and our 401 digital grease caddy. So We'll have an invite out for those two webinars on Monday, um, but keep an eye out on social media and things like that as we'll have the links out earlier than Monday. And then I'll just leave our contact info up here for a little bit. Sean, thanks again. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, hope to see a lot of you back here tomorrow and of course next week as well. And uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us here at UE Systems or at Iridicio. Um, like I said at the beginning, we're all here to help and, and we'll all get through this together and um, hope everybody stays healthy and safe and we'll catch you guys later.